All right, my brother. All right. I got I got an intro for old you. Old and great friend. Um, one of my oldest, oldest friends. Did you know there's Gladiator 2 getting made? Did you know that? I I don't want to fucking talk about it's it. It's real, dude. <laughs> it's a real thing. Anyway, oh, of course it is. It's they're, like, they're remaking King of the Hill. They're remaking... But Gladiator 2 is like, what? What could that be? Anyway. You know what I... You know, you know what, you know what they should remake immediately. By the, by the way, is eighty for Brady. That should be <laughs> what we should be talking about right now. <laughs> Just keep Let's remaking get some it. Fresh blood, dude. Every yeah. year they make eighty for Brady and they reboot 80 it. Eighty for Brady every year. Every year, I like every that. Every year, I like that and idea. It's always Brady. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> Adam. Yeah. It's frame rate. It sure I want to play a game with you. Uh-oh. I'm going to give you three prompts. Cross the room if you like something, if you have done something, or if you want to do something. Cross the room if you like movies. Do you cross? I cross. I cross the room. Cross the room if you're here to podcast with me. I cross the room, but I look suspicious. All right. Number three. Cross the room if you want to give me your wallet, all right? Just give me your wallet. I cross the room and look confused. <laughs> yes, I get his yes! wallet. And that's right. It's a frame rate. It sure and is. And we have a special two for one guest host today. Yeah. Adam Ganser. Double, double, double trouble. Uh, <clears throat> You're working two jobs tonight. I love it because they're, uh, they're t- double pleasures. To be podcasting with my double Abe. the fun. You That's know? the statement of the <laughs> state great, great of men. the podcasting. Spearmint gum. I nailed yeah. it. I nailed you it. Sure yep. did. <laughs> you're you're uh you're so I consider you a master of film. You're a film. Thank master. you. I don't. Yeah. But I love that you do, and I'll accept I your. Mean, do you still have a piece of paper that says master? Oh, I, that's, film? I do have a master's that says so you, master. You film. are a film master. That's true. I am. Here's the deal. Yep. I asked you to come here to help me cover a movie. I sure did. And I asked you, you know, give me some movies. And you gave me a few, but the first one that came to your mind, which I was excited about, is 2017's Good Time. So, Good as time. we typically do in, uh, which is the Robert Pattison, Safdie Brothers. Uh, kind of crime uh, movie if people are not so familiar. Go watch the trailer right now or watch the whole movie, why not? Because we're going to spoil it. And usually what we do on this podcast is we ask the new blood to explain why this movie. So uh, kind of tell me. Yeah. Um, so, well, I mean, first of all, this is a, this this actually goes back to our mutual friend, Greg Miller. Like, it's such a Greg Miller movie. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so I never, I always think of him whenever I watch this movie because it's super his vibe. Um, I thought of it because I kept trying to find a way to cover this on director piece. And then we, you and I both sort of agreed. It's probably too good of a film to get on director piece. I think so. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's sort of where we landed. And I kept like trying to make the argument, well, it wasn't up for any awards or anything, but I think as you rightly said, well, yeah, but like these are premium directors who are basically debuting here. You know, uh, I don't think it is actually their first film, but. It's certainly the first time we all heard about them. Right. Um, yeah. Uncut Gems is also. That's you their know, sequel. Which was up for a, a bunch of awards. Yes. And they did really well on the festival circuit, including Sundance with this film. Well, so, you can see why. I mean, like when you watch a yeah. film, you can. It's like, oh, OK. I, I don't think I've ever seen a film that feels like this. Exactly. Um, right. I also, as you know, am a, I love crime movies. Uh, I, mm-hmm. It would be one of my dreams come true to make crime movies. I just love them so much. Uh I don't know if I have quite this amount of intensity in me, though. You know, it's an intense movie. It's yeah. really intense. It's, it's very tense. Very tense. Yeah. yeah. Um. It's yeah. It's I th- actually would say it is kind of up your alley too, because yep. it thematically it kind of involves itself with kind of like a very internal and like self reflective struggle, um, indeed, as opposed to like dealing with the way the world, like kind of pushes you which is interesting because it actually it's as soon as i say it like it is kind of true that it's both like i want to point out like because it is truly about robert pattison and his like reaction to everything that occurs to him in the movie that's true but there's also like a sequence that i wanted to point out yeah. which i think you probably pointed out yeah or will fit like noticed which is that uh at a at a moment in the film about halfway through the film He's sitting down and watching TV with this uh, teenager named Crystal. And what they're watching on TV 
is in succession uh, the TV show Cops, yes. and then an ad for lawyers, yep. and then a news story about a pound, and we see images of dogs in cages, and then we see the news, which is like, they're hot on the trail because he's a fugitive. And he says, to justify that, he says, I don't want to see them justify the shit, turn it off. Like, that's yeah. who turns off the cops. And it's, so it's kind of, if you just look at that microcosm of what's on TV, what's the similarity there? They all signify being blocked in by the system, right? right. By their surroundings. Correct. And you do that in a keeper film where usually it's like the cops are chasing the robbers. So, um like to me that it, there is an element of the external pushing back on him and that's like his situation. But I wanted to ask you, like, is that what the movie is trying to say? Is that really the thing? I think it's saying both things actually. I think like, and I think a lot of great movies do say both things uh, because they explore the issue of what makes a man a All criminal. All around. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I would say even the filmmaking itself feels like it's pressing down on the characters in a very extreme way. Like for instance, first scene. Yeah. Um, both like we're, we're with Benny Safdie's character who I believe is Benny. I think he just goes by Benny. Is that right? I don't remember the name. I think he goes by Benny. And yeah. by the way, I have a joke that's just for you, which Thank is you. that Benny Safdie in this movie looks like he ate and absorbed Clay Thompson from the Golden State Warriors. <laughs> <laughs> and it hurt him the way that it would. Uh, <laughs> it hurt him. Uh, but anyway, that's correct. You're saying. I like that bit. So Benny Softy, who is one of the directors of the film, is also he plays the brother and he's quite good in the film. I mean, he really is. And yeah, is. the first scene is him being sort of interviewed by clearly like a medical psych psychiatric figure. I'm going to guess he's an actual psychiatrist <laughs> to assess both his culpability in the series of crimes we didn't see and also his mental acuity. Like, what is he capable of understanding or not? Um, through right. like, you know, very rudimentary psych psychology, anybody can see, but obviously this, this character has some, uh, some mental challenges and we're never totally clear exactly the nature of his, uh, comprehension, but he's, you know, uh, I think the right word is challenged, right? He, he has some mm -hmm. difficulties. Um, like he's probably b below average in terms of cognitive function. And the thing that's interesting about it is you never get a wide. You never get a wide shot. You, you rarely do in this movie. That's right. You only get this extremely long lens set of close-ups, basically, that are that like feel like you never <laughs> that room feels like it's two feet wide, which is very New York, right. but also is very like even the system itself to start when it's actually working. I'm gonna put that in quotes. When it's working, it's confining and you feel stressed out by it. Right. You know, and the movie never relents on that. Like the filmmaking is always making you stressed out because the only mm -hmm. time you get a wide shot ever is what you might call a surveillance drone wide. It's basically yeah, the only time. And he all the directors also use music. They oh, also yeah. uh craft scenes with people who have multiple ambitions or at least they want different things so yeah. they like ask about what they want so you have like too many threads going on that's where a it's huge like, thing in their movie that's a huge thing they do they, yeah they Is love this... to add basically pile problem after problem after problem on and most mm -hmm. of them are done by sound design Almost all. Yeah, of them. because people talking on top of each other. Yes. Uh, our editing is frenetic. Yes. And kind of, uh, you know, like net, net, you hear people off screen just as much as you hear them on screen. And it adds to this feeling that like there is a meandering kind of editor where it's just like, I'm just trying to catch up. I'm just trying to catch up to what all the things going on in this room. That's Which true. adds to the tension in all these scenes. And they do it to great effect. Artificially creating tension is a great like powerful thing that a, a director can have. They're so good at it. Uh, and the, and like they're, they're actually sort of ingenious in understanding how much information we can really process. Like, right. I think that's actually one of the things that makes them so gifted is that we, they give us enough that we actually process all the pieces <laughs> of stress they're adding, but we mm -hmm. still feel the stress. And I've never seen another director effectively do that. Like they, they, it really feels unique to them that they know how to make the stress of too many people in real life, too many things. Um, yeah. They also, I think are really good at abandoning the artifice of movie making. Like even though they're making a movie, they, everything about it from the casting to the way it's shot, to the way it's lit, 
to the pace of it, to the way stress is built, feels very much grounded in real life and not movie-ish <clears throat> at all. Almost ever. Hell yeah. Right? They're so uh, I'm good into at it. that. Yeah, it's, it reflects more of reality. Yes. Well, um, I mean, what we what we think of as reality, right? Like, uh, right. in I mean, you'll see faces in a movie by the Safdie brothers. You'll never see mm-hmm. in another movie. You just won't like. You just yeah, won't see people yeah. like that. You know? No, absolutely. Um, uh, and that's so cool. Normal looking people, yeah. ugly people. Yeah. You know, like just all over the board. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what it's bringing to the table you know like Absolutely. that's like that's it's absolute like bread and butter it's the thing it wants to show you have you heard of the um like you know how you have like modernist movement postmodernist movement have you heard of the uh post cinema movement no but i'm already the- thrilled please tell me <laughs> uh, about it i'm excited to talk to you about this okay, because great. i think it's actually becoming more true as time goes on um, and it's indicative of a lot of things, There's a lot of things going on. First thing I'll talk about is that when you hear that term post in like, uh, in art in, you know, post cinema, that doesn't mean the end of cinema. That means there's a transitionary phase. That's a, a transitional phase that's occurring where it's like, we're moving past this concept of just cinema. So a lot of the people who are talking about this, you can look it up online. If you just search for post cinema movement, uh, writers of this Shane Denson, Julia Leda, Travis Bean. These are all like critics who are talking about how for the last 20 years, We've been doing this thing with movies and would it be surprising to you that they categorize this movie and like Michael Bay's Transformer series in the same collection of movies? If, if Isn't that weird? We, yes, because they're like, what? They're completely different. But if right. they both are an attempt to undercut the, the conventions of traditional film, then I understand You're, that. Absolutely spot on. Right. In other words, plot has a series of actions and routines, right. genres and forms basically mimic, uh, you know, like what we saw before. You know, you can kind of think of this as a um, the hero story, right, where we all right. kind of know exactly what scene is next. Right. In fact, movies have done on very well in the last 20 years. Who know where we know often as the audience exactly what the scene is next uh, movies. Uh, like uh, are, that are like well-established IP is an example, like Lord of the Rings or like superhero movies or stuff, something. A lot of fans have read the book or played the game. So now there's an emphasis on translating entertainment into the, <clears throat> the ability to mimic the feeling or at least the turn the plot into something that's unexpected or less of a focus to adhering to a typical plot. Um, And there's a bunch of filmmakers that do this openly. And I think Michael Bay is one of them. I think they're right about this because he is well documented in talking about how he creates a sensory experience. One where pacing and momentum kind of become the thing that's precious. And they talk about you have plot holes and he's like, I don't give a fuck. Who gives about plot holes? I mean, yeah, you and I talked a little bit about that on the Michael Bay Armageddon director piece. Yeah. Right? And he's, I mean, yeah. And it, like him or hate him. I mean, like, I don't think, I don't think the quality of movie, I don't think good time is in the same category as Not Michael even close. Bay movies, Not even close. but I do yeah. think that they're doing something similar, which is, and it's still developing. So when we use that term post cinema and we're talking about how movies like postmodernism is really like the deconstruction of modernism and modernism would be the reappropriating of the forms of like the classics, you know, um, like, so it would be like, this is really trying to, it's a form of postmodernism, but it's not really trying to, it's not trying to deconstruct it. It's just not interested in it. And what's funny is that people have accused like the new star Wars, like JJ Abrams of this type of filmmaking, if not being the one who kind of started to pen it in a real way and for the mainstream, and it's a still developing kind of movement. See that, but that tells me that this label is too broad. If it's too broad, but like, just l- let me just give a definition yeah, yeah, sure, out there sure. for you. And then I think it, it kind of helps. Yeah. It's that it's an attempt to define what like define. It would be, it would focus on the now like fleeting moments in aim to kind of reflect more of reality and living moment to moment than after being able to comprehend what happened or finding meaning as we go. It's almost like finding meaning in these movies are almost always an after the fact kind of thing. And we're kind of propelled through this 
narrative structure that is usually foreign to us because we don't have any analogs of in the past where it's just like what happens next to Robert Pattinson well now he has to now he has to go get that LSD that's in this theme park you know like why is he doing that well we don't know really we know that it has to do with he loves his brother but his thinking isn't really the important part to us it's just motivated by what he feels he has to do which is much different than something like I don't know, like Billy Madison or like well, Adam, sure. an Adam Sandler film where it's like, well, you have to do it because you have to become the hero. So you have to get better at something so you can defeat the final boss. Well, it's, you know? it's very interesting, the period of time they selected, because it's very clearly a reaction to 90s cinema. Right. And 90s cinema yeah. in some ways is like a retro classic era, era like a golden mm-hmm. era of cinema, if you will. Uh, and that's, I'm not the only one that thinks that that's a, a fairly common critical opinion where they sort of not only was the 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 means to make films expanding to nearly anything as possible in the 90s right and the form was really expanding in that way but also mm-hmm. the themes and messages were sort of saturated in what you might call a kind of cultural complacency right right yeah and exactly that's really what it i like i think and maybe <clears throat> i'm wrong about this and i'm sure that you know a much wiser critic than me would tear me apart for this opinion but I think that ultimately the, this shift is less about being bored with cinematic conventions and more yeah. a symptom of a culture that's tired of malaise and feels anxious without relief. Like, yeah, uh, I think that, right? Yeah. No, I absolutely think you're right about that because I think that like not being satisfied with something is not kind of the vibe of what it has been the last 20 years. It's more, like it's interesting notion because like this this um this movement which is still being defined it's just happening now they aren't yet truly politicized like a lot of our genres are like because and i think it comes out of like you kind of just mentioned our financial culture the 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 the, the reality of our environment the feeling of our politics these are all uneasy feelings in this world it, yeah. in the last 20 years the death of optimism and like I would say, dead, in general, yeah. optimism is is a dead, is a dead, uh, is a dead motif for most people intellectually and emotionally mm-hmm. writ large in our culture, and that was not true in the nineties. <laughs> right. You Think know? about just the financial kind of culture now. There's people in mass. There's a lot more people now that are more, you know. Their, their brain is configured now to the day to day, right? It's like they're highly reactionary because they feel they have to, because they don't really have a ability to kind of get out of it. That's, you know, I, I bring up like the TV sequence again, like just the idea of like poor people watching cops, you know, right. like what is that? What is that po- a postcard of? Well, it feels like they're locked in a cage and they don't have power to watch anything else. Or it's the most interesting thing on because they don't have access to a lot of things. And that's just a small microcosm, but it makes sense to me that it, whatever this movement gets defined as later down the road, or as it's, you know, redefining itself every year with new movies, that are you know that are interested in this kind of thing the reactionary kind of contemplative like non-contemplative like let's look at the now is really fostered by a culture that is very uh very involved with the now as opposed to what are these things it's because the now is the only thing that's now certain you know like like in certain yeah i mean certain in a very loose sense it's the it's the only thing that's concrete that's tangible and therefore uh meaningfully responsible you know and like we could get i right. mean i feel like any of us could find obvious parallels with our economic prospects and you know the mm-hmm. the lie of education and the lie of financial prosperity and all the things that we've all spent reams of time and ink talking right. about on the internet um but i think this movement is interesting insofar as what it's trying to label is an abandonment of the sacredness of the forms of hero's right. journey and also cinematic constructs and but identifying the the endeavor to tell stories in that climate you know and like w- what are the right. things that symbolize it and it's telling that jj J. abrams beat for beat remake of star wars is in the same category as this film good time you know 
Yeah, I mean, like I, I would say it's more the rise of Skywalker, where it right. absolutely abandons any form. Sure, but yeah, I mean, it's it's the idea that he's occupied with, like he doesn't care about plot holes either. And this movie, in a lot of ways, doesn't care about plot holes, right? It, like, it, I think it gets away with plot holes a lot. It try yeah. it gets away with it, but if we take ourselves seriously, for example, Connie is very charismatic. Yep. Connie being absolutely uh, Patterson. He's kind, he's polite, but he gets so much leeway from other people. He's like, I want to use that phone. He's getting away with dinner. a lot of shit that he should not <laughs> be getting away with. Or use someone's hair dye. Give me half yeah, your bro. take. That's my favorite one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and like in a very crucial moment, Crystal doesn't tell the police that like, no, it's that guy. That guy's the aggressor. I don't take me to jail. Take that guy to jail. But instead she's like, no solidarity i'll take this i'll take this one for you um even though like you have clearly lying to me this whole time and this is obvious now um so yeah that's one of the things where it's i'm not knocking this movie for saying that i think the movie is trying to kind of exemplify that these things sometimes don't matter to someone who's just going through the motions because like at the base of this movie is a brother's love right i mean well that's the question right is like is it really about love that's or is it about uh is it about sort of rage yeah, i guess a rage against a system that failed them and like wanting to sort of control their reality uh which is a form of love that you know it's toxic but it's a form that i understand i would say <clears throat> abe that that plot hole that you pointed out and a couple of others that popped to mind have actually be like I think they've we've exposed how entitled the thinking is of him as a character as the cultures become yes. more aware of that dynamic. Like so, like five yeah, years yeah. ago when this movie came out, or six years ago, I don't think we were as aware of how it, ridiculous what he's trying to do really is. You know, mm. like now it like I I felt like viscerally upset at him kissing her. You know, she's 16 yeah. and like like him right. kissing her was like, I mean, I was upset the first time, but man, I got more upset this time. I was like, bro, what? Like, you're a fucking scumbag, yeah. you know? Um, and the movie tries to not justify it. It's never move trying on to justify from it. Just move past it. But it, it moves on from it by saying like, oh, his, so his, his face comes up on the TV screen and he needs to distract her. And the only thing he can think of is to kiss her. And she's like into and it. it but works. then he... Yeah. proceeds to like take her to her bed and says well the next consequential thing i guess is that i'm gonna fuck you 16 year old and that really gnarly and, uh, yeah really for uh, like for yeah for me as a viewer as well i was just like this guy's a piece of shit yeah. he'll do anything and that was always the point let's be clear the safety brothers were yeah. always telling the story of a piece of shit exploiting other people to get away with these crimes and in theory you know, live a new life, right? I mean, that's that's really what this is ultimately about, right? <clears throat> Him and his brother There's being a, together, having yeah. their own life, you know? Having a good time. Yeah. Which is, which is why in the third act we get that uh, conversation with Ray, which yeah. is the person he accidentally saves from the hospital thinking it's his brother, who uh, kind of takes over the movie at a certain point. He sure does. And he's an alcoholic and he just got out of jail and he just drinks and he's, you know, like he's a loser as, um, you know, Connie calls him. And he's like... You immediately drink. You're a piece of shit. You're not yeah. worth like you're not worth what society is putting into yeah. you. Yet this guy is a bank robber right. because he doesn't believe in the system. And so he's taking, you know, the bank's money. And there's a lot of political. It's a little bit more politically nebulous about it. But he really does feel that he's better than he even says yeah, at one he point, does. I am better than you. Yep. Um, it's a great and line. Too. And and, it, you know. Politically, think what you want about those two different, you know, like as he kind of puts it, parasites on society. He says, I'm a better, like, I'm better than you. Um, think what you want about either of those. But like when it comes down to it, he is qualitatively assessing others in the same way that we are kind of condemning and saying. And I think the movie is condemning he's, because he's I think what we're all doing. And that's kind of what's fun about yeah. it is like everybody's a judge. Every, everybody right. even the scummiest guy in the world is judging somebody else like that's that's part of what this is that's part of how the world works and why it doesn't work in a lot of ways right like this guy's yeah. delusion and lack of self-awareness about how much of a drag he is is actually the narrative arc of the story you right know? that's uh, what this movie's about want, ultimately right so i want to dissect the ending a little bit 
or at least one maneuver that the ending does yeah. and get your thoughts yeah, on yeah. it is that as we see in the ending, we, we get that, you know, the bit that I did at the beginning of this, where as a therapy section, he, uh, Nick is now a part of like a group therapy, which we haven't seen now. So right. he's getting help in quote unquote, a healthy way. Right. And as it's, as the, as it's kind of manufactured by the movie, it's said like, you're going to have a good time. Um, so we're all chasing this good time. And this is apparently what the movie is saying that this is Nick's good time. I don't know if Nick agrees with that, but this is what, you know, a psychiatrist is saying. And they say, cross the room. If you've ever lost cross the room if you've ever not gotten along with your family members right. cross the room if you've ever been blamed for something you didn't do and then over it is this Iggy Pop song yep. which paraphrased it basically states that the pure which is just you know uh, a name that he Iggy Pop isolates for a, di a dichotomy of the two types of people in the world and the damned the others both act from love and so that to me now exposes a theme because now you're asking yourself about, okay, so you're sending this form of the pure and the damned. So who's the pure in this one? It's probably what they're saying is Nick. And they're probably saying Con Connie is the damned, right? It's a, that's uh, the I, obvious comparison. That's the obvious comparison. I would say they both so are I'm, both. Yeah, exactly. I think a little bit, I think a little bit. Um, because I think it has to do with more than just like the internal struggle. It's also what's, what does justice mean in this broken system? And so these aren't questions really with great answers. Like, you know, is Nick better off with Connie or is Connie the only one who truly cares for him? There's only once again, the now what's reality now. And that's kind of, it's not opting out of answering those questions. It's just saying there really isn't. And I think there's something that there was in, in an interview that uh, uh, one of the Safdie brothers mentioned is that the reason that they chose the song is they really admired the clarity or like the emphasis of like, wow, you really went for it and said, there's two types, the pure and the damned, and they both act from love. Um, um, that's a, it's interesting. I, I think that that's, I mean, it's definitely interesting. I mean, that's also what you might call the happy ending interpretation of what happened. You know, for real. like, like I, I would say that's, that's the decision to view uh, Connie's behavior as heroic, ultimately. You know, and I don't, and I, and I mean, I, the movie is never, ever making excuses for him. I think the movie is pretty clear that uh, he's a broken, toxic person who destroys everything he touches. That's who he is. Um, I think the movie is also maybe gently suggesting he does have some pure motives, right? Like the, like his, his love for his brother even though it's wrong and uh, it's actually hurting his brother is coming from a good place. Right. And uh, his decision to allow himself to be in jail and allow his brother to move on with his life is, uh, you know, a symbol of that. He actually does love his brother, right? That's the idea. So mm -hmm. I guess in that way, uh, the song is sort of a commentary on both, things but also redemption for connie because the film does seem to want that um also iggy pop yeah, I, wrote this for the film yeah oh i didn't yeah know they that. hired they he, he wrote he it for the film him. apparently according to vulture that's what happened oh okay that's cool yeah that's that cool. is cool uh i think that's interesting because yeah it's kind of like in a way it's almost like the safety brothers chose the song because of they're kind of they're kind of trying to dissect or at least point at that that purity, that binary aspect is kind of flawed, right? Because you can say, as the movie says, through uh, the psychiatrist at the end, you know, Nick, you're where you belong. And Connie is where he belongs. Everyone is where they belong. Um, and that's, quote, unquote, the good time, you know, and different people have different elements or different aspects of what they think the good time is. You know, Ray is like, I, he, he, at some point we have a, you know, like montage where he's like, I was having a good time and he's like, and you're going to watch me and you're going to eat your whole foot when I'm driving a Lambo and I passed. Yeah. You know, that by, guy. Wow. And yeah. stuff like that guy. So it's like, I think the binary system of this is what's good and this is what's bad is now being kind of like, they chose that song specifically to be like, I don't think it is that cut and dry. You know, they both act from love, but that's all we can really say because at the end, Who's to say where people belong? I thought it was that you That's belong an interesting where you interpretation, want to belong. Uh, and exactly what I would expect from an Abe, and I love it. Uh, you should know he wrote <laughs> the song 
after watching the movie. He watched the movie and wrote the song in response to the movie. Um, so it's actually his interesting. interpretation of the film. I think it's interesting that you think the good time is is an applicable piece of information about what about the meaning of the film because I don't think it is. Like I, I, I think it's something that people are chasing for sure. I would say, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's right. I would say. So what do you mean? It's. Yeah, I guess there. I guess that's right. I guess it's like everybody's version. I of, mean, that's all it really is. It's kind of like the like in. If you were to like in Mad Men, it's like the American dream, you know, kind of idea. Like it's right, the thing it's that ideal. they're trying to it's an ideal right. that people who we all have and we all share and we're all part of right now. And having a good time is once again very enamored with the present, with the now. Right. I'm having, a, having good a good time is usually how we use that phrase. Right. And uh they're deconstructing that in a way, or at least saying like it's false. Yeah. Or it, it's, I, and it exists on a, you know, shoddy. Iggy of, pop is know, legitimately ground. saying that, like literally saying that like the lyrics every day, I think about untwisting and untangling these strings I'm in and le to lead mm -hmm. a pure life. I look ahead at a clear sky, ain't going to get there, but it's a nice dream. It's a nice dream. Right. That's, right. that's very clearly the theme as you're stating it. I feel like movies have been basically saying that for 40 years. Like, I don't think that's a think new so. sentiment. That's true. I think we've been saying it gently and then more self-consciously and then more desperately ever since John Paul Sartre picked up his pen. Oh, you for know? real. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, we just kind of like are rehashing new themes because we're like, oh, our, we have a police state or, ah, oh, <laughs> right. like we, uh, you know, we are, we don't accept others and we're very xenophobic or whatever it is. You know, like whatever is currently kind of the thing that people want to talk about is what becomes 1984 or whatnot. Um, so, yeah, I think that this is very this is not a message that's new. It's just one that's very apt for the times. Right. That's all the best. I think, yeah. And I think it feels grounded in the times because the movie feels so grounded in a place and time. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, like just just like little <laughs> things like. You know, a lot of big parts of the plot of this film revolve around phones being charged, you know, and revolve right. around like the fact that money can be rigged to explode with like paint now. Uh, yeah. And just like things that are like, yeah, that's very much of that of our time stuff that wouldn't have happened even 40 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and. I Yeah. So I think in it, just the idea that it's so grounded in those things makes the commentary feel more biting, even though it's not even that yeah. specific ultimately, you know, like it's not that specific. Not really. It's just trying to say, here are the fictions we tell ourselves and lead us to the next thing. And we feel that we need to do that because we can't help ourselves it, because we love it's broad you know, enough. We do things. really that it, it sort of allows enough room for anybody from any particular vantage point to find a way to interpret it. That feels <laughs> meaningful. Like, I would say, like, imagine if I was conservative, right? If I was a conservative person, mm -hmm. I feel like I could watch this movie and, and immediately identify, like, uh, well, this is the story of a, of a criminal finally realizing what he is. And I'd be right. Right. Yeah. I would be right about that. Yeah. I mean, you it know? is a, a part of that, uh, that. That is a part of this is that he chose to ch like people choose people who are victims, but also victimizing others. He continuously... That, that's the thing is it's all about the portrayal and that would be the misunderstanding of that take in my particular read is that there's scenes that you get several times like not just the cops TV segment but there's a segment at one point in Ray's story where he's yet again chasing a good time and he's hiding the drugs and he gets in a cab and he's just like man I just want just take me home I'll give you the money and then yeah. he says the word jail and the cabbie hears the word and jail freaks and he's out. like you yeah. you're jail he freaks out he's like you get out of my car right, right now you get out of my car and then you know he's like you know what fuck it I'm taking you to the police and so he just guns it and that's when Ray gets injured is that he jumps out of the car that's two people who have no reason to fight but are fighting because of their preconception of how if, on one end it's someone who's asking for like his fellow man to, you know, help me even though you don't know me. And then, and that's a presumption. And then on the other side, you got someone who's like, my prejudices tell me that you're going to fuck me up. 
And so because of the system that we're in, you, I'm going to nullify your ability to have any power in this situation. So it's very much like there's infighting because of the systemic kind of way in which we've built, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, certain it's po- definitely, part of the population it's lives. It's assumed into the fabric of the movie. Like it, it's kind of assumed. It's, it's yeah. like if you were directing the film, you would call them previous circumstances, right? Like, and that's, yeah. that is what it is like in an, so in some ways, like we're we're all trained now through, you know, our various film interpretive grids to pull forth those assumptions and examine them. And uh, I think this film is good in that it, it layers enough reality that there is commentary there. Uh, but what mm-hmm. but like what I find, I guess, riveting about it is that like all these assumptions are basically unexamined. Almost every single decision that gets made in this film by the protagonist and by every character in it until right at the very end, like the literally the like the moment he gets locked up in the cop car is entirely reactive. Every single thing is like just a reaction to what yep. came before it by everybody. Well, I have to do this. Yeah. Rarely does. Uh, and the times that he is like pushing forward towards some agenda, which is almost always calling the, uh, going to the bails bond. And when he, they take over adventure lane and he becomes the security guard, he calls, you know, like, I want to see where's my brother at. And they're like, I can't give you that information. Once again, the system literally has stop gaps where he's allowed to do stuff. And he is like, Oh, I can't. So literally nothing came of that. So anytime he tries anything in his agenda, nothing ever happens it's like from that it. don't happen. Right. But guess what does motivate the plot? Your reactionary moment to moment mistakes. Uh, ability, yeah. your mistakes, the thing, the, you know, how many, t- there's like at a certain point it becomes almost laughable because he just keeps going like, fuck, you know, he's just like at a certain point, it's just like one thing after another, let me just get to my brother. Um, and it's just, it's, it's kind of almost tra- it's a tragic kind of comedy in that way. There is something um, almost comic about it that gets brought up a little bit from time to time. Like it really gets brought up <laughs> when we find out that he picked up the wrong person from the hospital. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's an absurd it kind of feels offer. Big Lebowski. Yeah. That's like Big Lebowski right. shit. You that's know? a wild offer. It doesn't feel like it couldn't happen. It feels like it could happen. Right. But it's uh it's a wild choice for a movie for it that that big of a fuck up is insane you know uh yeah and like the i mean i guess it would be pretty clear that when she goes in the back at the beginning of the film the the bank teller where i have to go get some other stuff like if you want more money i have to go get it like i have to go to the back she's installing as well that paint bomb right she were he a better you know robber he would know you know he would know that something would be up in that moment probably i mean yeah that was it's that not that he's like terrible he's not terrible they got away with it 90 percent. but he makes mistakes pretty right. yeah that's right that's true that's really what it boils down to is like every one of his best laid plans ends up <coughs> just totally decimating the person that he was collaborating with all of them unintentionally mm-hmm. like i don't think except for maybe jennifer jason lee's character I don't think he ever sets out to screw somebody over. Fantastic. He just does. Uh, well, he just yeah. does. That's true. I mean, I don't think there's that. Uh, let's talk sure. about that a yeah, little sure. bit because let's talk about the unique kind of we we talked about. We know Connie is like a con right. man. Uh, we know he's a bank robber. An extremely desperate um, con man with like hours left to get his yes. plan underway. He's on Super the Super desperate. Yeah. Yeah, and the and that's one of the things that propels like the absolute like momentum of the movie. But we also kind of described him as he's very kind, he's very polite. Um, he's civil. So I think like, civil is maybe the right word because he's not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's he yeah, he yeah, is yeah. charming when he needs to be. He definitely knows that he is good looking enough to get away with shit. That's yeah. true. I think that he does use what he's got. Oh, 100%. Um, and it, it's not strength. At one point, he tells Nick, like, you were so good up there, looking all strong, making it feel you know, like he was telling his brother, because his brother's physically bigger, like, he wouldn't be, brother, I wouldn't be able to do this if it weren't for you. Trying to build up his brother. But what's interesting to me is that I noticed halfway through, because this actually was the first time I'd seen this movie. Oh, interesting. Um, his, his tactics for everything was to make it always simpler for him about lying about reality to others, yep. right? 
he'd almost always promise a good time or until he couldn't until it was just like, let's get out of this and it'll be better. But like at up front, he's always like, look, it's going to be great. Like he even tells uh, Jennifer Jason Lee, like start picking out like, you know, like on your phone, start finding like, we're going to go to fucking the tropics with all this money. Which and of course, uh, he I was think never going to do that. Right. We agree on that. Right. We yeah. knew that, but it's like, it's to kind of juxtapose with how their life is hard and how they kind of cope with it. Um, I think is what they're doing there, but it's like, look at all the people that you meet in the film. It's how he talks to her, Corey, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee. Um, it's talks to Nick that way. There's a woman from the accessor ride, which is the grandma of crystal who he kind of abducts by, you know, the teenager, um, where he's just like, then like he lies to her about like, I, we live nearby, but I lost my keys. Uh, you know, like, <clears throat> and like, we're going to get out of here by seven and stuff like that. And this is well before he even knew that he picked up the wrong guy, not to mention Ray who himself, he's like, yeah, yeah, we'll get out of this. We'll get out of this. And also when Ray tells him about the LSD that he's got stashed, he's like, we're, we're going to split this now. So it's always someone else's fault or he's always trying to choreograph events that benefit him. Um, and it's usually comes in the form of lies. The I movie think that leaves that is, it ambiguous enough that you can sympathize with that if you want to, or you yes, can overtly exactly. condemn him. The movie does introduce him in a way where it's pretty clear what he's doing is bad. Like, and I don't mean mm -hmm. bad like he's evil. I mean, he beats the shit out of random people. Well, I think the first, the, the, we meet him by him literally interrupting a therapy session for his brother. And that interruption is very clearly violent and he clearly has no right to be there. And one can say, well, I don't trust the system. That's fine. But the movie's not doing any work to establish that there. That's just sort of a baked yeah. in question, in fact, I would the say. Movie's doing a lot of work to make me believe that this psychiatrist he, he might is be trying right. to just diagnose yeah. and like, yeah, he might, he might be all be right. Fine. He's at least just, hey man, what's going on with you? He's talking. There's to a him. kind of moral ambiguity that the movie lives in that I think is pleasant, uh, because mm -hmm. it makes it possible to uh feel included in everything <clears throat> that happens without feeling like you had to agree or disagree with it. Like I like this right, is in yeah. that nice sort of comfortable, like you think what you want about this zone. Although I think he does right. do some like objectively heinous things to whatever degree we yeah, can say like that to the security guard that. You know? Okay. So like, let's talk briefly about that. So like, yeah, yeah. Okay. So when he, so basically his scheme is to try to break his brother out of hot of the hospital he's in after the robbery goes wrong and he gets captured. Right. So he breaks into mm -hmm. the hospital he gets the wrong guy out of the hospital. That takes like 30 minutes to discover. He weasels his way. I'm using judgmental words, but he, he connives his way into uh, an old black woman's <coughs> house with a young granddaughter and then convinces them to let him stay there while his mom, quote unquote, is going to come pick him up. And then he realizes he's got the wrong guy and the wrong guy actually has a line on something that will give them money. That something is a bottle of Sprite that is full of pure LSD. Like, it's pure liquid LSD, okay? So they break into this place where the bottle of LSD was left by some other heist that went wrong, a bunch of other ne'er-do-wells who left it there. With With, Ray, with yeah. this and guy who he accidentally broke out of the fucking uh, hospital. And they a security guard who, by the way, is... I think he's Somalian? Something like that. He's like... A, he, he's yeah. definitely an immigrant, which matters because this guy's just trying to get by in life. You know, that that's who he is. He's working a security guard at an abandoned, mm -hmm. uh, or not even abandoned, but like non-working, uh, uh, theme park, which is funny. Cause they muddle that too. Cause when they go back to his apartment, he has like a cushion. Yeah, his apartment, apartment was nice. That I was a little confusing, was but in any case, this guy's, you know, <clears throat> clearly also trying to survive in this world. Right. As everyone here is, that's right. not a bail bondsman basically. Yeah. Yeah. He's a security yeah, And leader. like, so they For basically end park. up kicking his ass to get away and one of the two, not Connie, pours, I'm going to say, a cup, a Half cup, the bottle. like a full cup of LSD in that man's mouth. Like right. the amount of LSD is deeply upsetting. 
like deeply yes. upsetting. It's like that man. That guy is fucked for the next like week. But I think like it would do permanent damage to your brain. I don't know. It? I don't know if they've met. I could be talking out my ass. Someone chime in who knows about LSD. But my understanding is at a certain point, especially with LSD, uh, you 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 just pass it. You just pa- your your body shuts down and says nope. Kind of like it does with like a lot of things, like even vitamins. You know, it's just like I'm sure it will do. I'm sure. I'm sure his brain is his brain chemistry is fucked for the next uh, for the next like. I mean, few days. He, well, he's like. Yeah, he he's but in I don't he's know in how... a hellscape for a week. Yeah, I mean he can't. He has he they as they portray him as they're as they basically at that point, uh, Connie puts on his clothes and acts as the security guard and then blames him as the perp that like he called. So he called the police on himself right. because Connie is smart. Connie's enough smart enough to kind of navigate right. that. Yeah, and he plays it perfectly. Um, and the cops don't think twice about it. But yeah, he is so fucked and he is intelligible unintelligible when he's getting put into the uh it's heinous man because he it's he can't even defend himself uh and that's like you have just skipped right past so many levels of your that fucked that guy is now i think that eventually they're going to figure it out because they're like that's but the it's just guy. long enough and they find buys him, him a couple hours but it's just long enough it buys him a few hours then they um, break into his house yeah. which like i mean i get it they're desperate so they're doing what they're doing but it's like when you stop right. and think about what happened, it's pretty gnarly. Um, and then Connie basically leverages this bottle of Sprite to get the guy who made it, who's like, you know, what seems like a small time drug dealer, basically, who may or may not be armed. That was not totally clear. Uh, give yeah. me $15,000 so I can make this dream happen again. And that results in the cops being called and him uh, running for his life. And ultimately, the death of this guy who he pulled out of the hospital. Yeah, Ray, that guy da- dies. Ray tries to escape from the balcony and he falls because he's a fuck up. And it's up. really uh, gnarly. It's like, whoa. Trying to escape. It's like, yeah. like, well, first of all, this is part of what makes the Safety Brothers so good. They filmed it in a way that felt very YouTube, right? Like, it's, it's, uh, it's just. It's at a distance. Yeah. It's like a phone. It's, it's, yeah, not a very footage, good footage. Yeah. So, like, when the guy actually falls, a thing you don't see in movies much. You know, mm-hmm. when he falls, it's it shocks you and uh, they play it in real time. And it's like it's upsetting. I thought, did you find it? upsetting? Yeah, it's upsetting. Yeah, because he's screaming all the yeah. way down. Oh, my God. Uh, I think it's the sound design that really does it. Uh, there's also, I believe, music at yeah. that point that has like yeah, cut yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you're like primed. You're primed for a big. Like, right. Crescendo they do there. do that. That's um, right. And which is just once again great tactics to build tension, but it's really effective. Is the the bottom line? It's here. it's just like um, the like every moment to moment you understand the decision this guy makes. All of them make sense. All of them are motivated from his desperate need. All of them seem even defensible on some level, right? I mean, mm-hmm. with a few exceptions, but like the grim total of what his decisions add up to is staggering. You know, like it's just staggering the amount of death and sorrow he's created in 24 hours, you know? Right. Yeah. He he got a 16 year old girl because he wanted to jail. Yeah. Put in jail uh, a guy that he pulled from a hospital who is about to be on parole. Is dead now. But ends up is now dead. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. There's a lot of and all because he can't find his brother. He can't. Which he also put in jail by bringing him on this like because. Let's be, I mean, I, the, I'm not scared of the, having this opinion. I don't think Nick should be uh, robbing banks. You I don't know? think either like of them should not, be robbing banks. <laughs> like, yeah, he's <laughs> develop, yeah. developmentally disabled yeah. brother should not be <laughs> robbing banks. Yeah, if any, you know, I just think that Robert Pattinson could probably rob a bank and we'd probably all be fine with it. Well, if you, <laughs> you mean know, like that you the, are, are fine with, uh, like, like, I believe that he can do it and get away with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You if you totally mean it's good it. that he's robbing a bank, no. I'm not saying it's good. <laughs> no, I don't agree with that. I'm not saying it's yeah. good uh, necessarily. I'm just saying that, like, you seen him in Tenet? Like, he that guy could rob a bank. Oh, I seen him in Batman? <laughs> uh, he yeah, is, oh, yeah, he's he is Batman. the Batman, so he could rob as many banks Batman. as he wants. Fucking Put Batman. some of that eyeshadow on. I'm, I'm good with it. For, I'm real for good like, with it. 
probably like eight hours there. I forgot about Batman. <laughs> you, you, you just brought me right back, dude. You just Honestly, right I think back. this role is pretty important to establishing what it's makes him good, good. At the, like good enough to be the Batman. Yeah, you know? because of the the kind of moral ambiguity, yeah. the rooting for, yeah. but also the uh, a, like not able to justify, but able to think about in a in a kind of balanced way how fucked up this all is. Like, um, I would never. I mean, this is of course the most obvious fucking blogger opinion, but like, you <laughs> wouldn't think he would do movies like this after the beginning of his career. Twilight, you mean? Well, and also Harry Potter. It's both things, right? Like that's how he got. Oh his, yeah, he was in. Harry yeah, Potter. The, you know that was a big role. Like those early starts felt like, you know, he's on rom com lead trajectory for That's the rest right, of his life. That's right, because he was he was uh he was like I can do no wrong. He right. was like the perfect boy. Right. That's what he was. And I remember, yeah, in the Harry Potter, he's like he dies, right? And he yep. and his dad's that's like correct. My boy, my boy, my beautiful my boy, boy, my boy. Which is hilarious. And you're like, oh, that's a shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, hilarious because like your boy is a vampire yeah, and Batman. He's, your boy's fine. He's Batman, bro. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's Batman. He screams my boy in a way that it does hurt you when you're watching. It's it, memorable. But it's very funny. Yeah, you go, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that father is broken for the rest. Very of his much life. so. Uh, very yeah. much so. That said, I hope that my father says that when I die. Oh yeah. Well, hope, you hope you I die hope before that. your father. Is that what you're saying? I didn't think yeah. this through. <laughs> <laughs> I would say. Uh, I would say that uh, I think he's shown such good taste in his roles, like yes. like almost every role he's taken since uh, Twilight has been a good decision, you know, and and great roles and have expanded what he's capable of in ways that are very exciting. You know, this role is yeah, he's not going to this role's wild, like just the intensity it's a great of role, it, you know, he has to carry the entire movie, yep. which is like, if anything Safety brothers, Safety brothers get credit for calling that shot, you know, and getting them because a lesser actor would not be able to carry this as a, expertly, and he really does. Like they're good. I at, really did. I interrupted you. When, Sorry. No, I'm just gonna say, like, kind of just more on like how Connie perceives the world and how he justifies this shit. There's one point he asked. There's a uh, Crystal asks him a question about like you got the wrong guy. Like talking about Ray. Like that's not your brother. He's like no, and he says the hospital fucked up. It's not my fault. Right. And I don't know how that's many right. times I've heard readings of someone saying it's not my fault, but he somehow made me go like yeah, it isn't his fault. And then I immediately thought, oh wait, what the fuck am I thinking? Like no, it is his fault. Like it's all it's also his fault. Right. <laughs> like, these are like, not mutually exclusive. Uh, these are not mutually exclusive. But he really got like it was such a good read, such a good like emotional beat for him to deflect. I'll tell you to say like I don't want to deal with this. That I was like he he had me going for a second. The Safdie brothers are very good at finding the the sort of like scrappy, uh, almost primal weasel part of our nature in people you mm -hmm. would not expect to find it. From, like, like they found yeah, it in Adam him. Ganser. Or Adam Ganser. Well, you, I have you, it too, you, baby. Cast me. You have it too. Cast me. Yeah, I'll be a desperate Adam Sandler. Is I'll be a desperate of, giant. Right? Uh, yeah. you know, Ooh. trying to claw my way out of the Ooh. abyss or whatever the role is. Hell um, yeah. please don't cast me. I would, I'm a terrible actor. Uh, <laughs> but like you know, I mean, Robert Pattinson. I guess he's done a couple roles that have shown that kind of vulnerability. But in general, he seems like a fairly uh grounded person. Like a very like a fairly mm -hmm. reserved person. This role really brought out some like something very snarling in him that I really liked. Uh, and obviously mm -hmm. Adam Sandler's performance in Uncut Gems is like generational. <laughs> you know, he's incredible in that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so these guys have a lot of talent at a, in a, in all aspects of filmmaking. You know. Yeah. Um. They really are good at the. You know, they do this thing where the like the score doesn't really stop and yes. it doesn't let up. Yes. And I've made movies like that before, and it's not easy to do because sometimes it can become so overwhelming that like it's now a distraction. Um, and movies like uh, like I think uh, there will be blood, and this movie uh, are good examples of like oh nope, adequately like deployed exactly when you did the music, especially when it's um, textural like both of these movies. And right? Not, yeah. Not as much. Like it's not John Williams or, you know, like, it, well, yeah, it's not even Hans Zimmer. It's a lot more textual, like textural than either of those composers generally right. do. 
but <laughs> they do. Yeah, they are masters of knowing how much information we can absorb and stay focused. They're very good mm-hmm. at that. Um, yeah. And it's almost like, and that's a new kind of trend. Like I thought of yeah. uh, something we've covered in this, it follows, which is mm-hmm. on the other side of the map in that it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily pointing out, uh, you know, kind of tension, but more evoking dread. And it's done with these long drone notes that slow the movie down to like a yep. uh, twin peaks level. Yep. And that is to me doing a very similar thing than this is, even though, you know, like, auditorially they sound absolutely like opposites but it's this like i think it's it's true that they're both synth kind of heavy but it's this idea of like is it agitated or is it like you're setting a tone and they really do use score effectively in this movie and they take it away at times it's not wall to wall they know when to uh, they know when to let up on it yeah i mean again like their sense of how to create a landscape outside of the camera like outside of the view of the camera is uh pretty pretty magnificent really uh mm. in, in every way like their cinematic sense of music and their sense of how to layer reality onto the frame when like again remember there's nothing in the fucking frame <laughs> you know what I mean the frame is usually it's a close up, an yeah. extreme close up of Robert Pattinson looking desperate that's the that's all they're shooting here and like uh they managed to make you feel all the claustrophobia of New York is this, this is in New York, right? Am I mistaken about that? Yeah, this is New York. Yeah, it yeah, felt yeah, like yeah. it. Um, right, and I, nobody needed to tell me that. It just felt like it. It's like, this is what, how the city really feels to somebody, uh, mm-hmm. you know, when it's not being romanticized or idealized in any right. way. I think our last episode of Director Peace Theater was on claustrophobia, right? Um, yes. And it kind of uses this, it uses the same tactics. Yes. And, you know, this is not director piece theater. This is frame rate. Not but, today. Know, it's Adam and Abe. Mm. So we talk about director shit because that's what we like. It's true. Um, yeah. So I think all in all, Safdie Brothers fucking killing it. Um, it's a great film. These are very exciting filmmakers. And uh, if I wasn't deeply jealous of anyone that gets to make movies, I would be heartily thrilled for them. And get, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, like they think they're great. That's I hope my crest bear. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope they keep making yeah. stuff. It's it's awesome, and I'm a big fan. But I, but you know, <clears throat> but but me first. <laughs> but me first. Um, and I'll take a quote from I don't know how many times I've uh, said this to my other brothers, and I would include you as a brother. Oh, uh, one of the opening same. lines in this movie. Fuck grandma. It's just you and me. Fuck baby. grandma. <laughs> and that's what I want. That's what I want to give to you, Adam. Thank you. Fuck camera. Fuck grandma. It's just you and me. I'm so glad um, you said it too. I mean, I don't have any grandmas left, so that cost me nothing. <laughs> it's that cost me literally good. nothing. It's just, I mean, that's, that's, that's the movie in a nutshell right there. <laughs> Fuck grandma. It's just about the now. Yeah. I am really eager about like, uh, how post cinema and if this is even relevant like grouping this movie in with things like paranormal activity or Star Wars Rise of Skywalker Transformers Quantum Solace is another one that I, I, I think like, that I just, mentioned it. I have this visceral reaction to it that I understand is partly it's partly informed by understanding critical theory and partly yeah. and partly just like pure traditionalist that label is lazy <laughs> That label is fucking lazy. The post cinema, yeah, it's yeah, lazy it's, and nondescript. Because what do you call it at this post post remodernism? Well, that's they the problem. For See, and I feel like it, it's only effective insofar as it's describing the actual problem of cinema and and art and literature right. in this time, which is we don't have a new thing. We just don't, we don't want the old thing. thing. They're globbing onto, I think, the idea of like the reason it's post cinema, from what I understand, is that it seems like it came from the democratization and like development of new tools. For example, the second like there used to be many movies made that were very kind of uh, you know punctuated by just what they were trying to do. What the the real is, you know, cinema verte is the name that we've given in like the '60s and whatnot. That was like this is like being a fly in the wall or documentary or whatnot. But <clears throat> post cinema can is specifically developed out of we now have tools that make what used to be impossible 
is now very probable because we have things like CG or like, right. you know, like GoPros and stuff. Right. And so the reason I think that that's relevant and from a technological standpoint is that when you look narratively at what that really ultimately means is that the the stories that we're telling can go anywhere. Uh, so what are we going to do with that? Well, now we can now if we, we if we can do anything, we're going to do all those movies and then what's left? So post cinema really comes down to, I think, the tools where it's like interactivity is now like a place that we're probably going to go, you know, like gaming and 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 movie making is going to become more of a, you know, kind of um, amalgam. So I think when they say post cinema, they're also kind of they like the term because it also means we're entering the phase where cinema isn't alone. There's other components that can be involved into it. Uh, there, there's advantages to the term, and uh, I would gladly spend one hour explaining why, <laughs> like from every it's vantage part, point yeah. of meaning, it's useless, uh, mm-hmm. other than grouping together a period of time. Uh, it, it's, it just, it doesn't identify anything meaningful as a symmetry between things, other than a reaction <laughs> to other movies. Yeah, that's I mean, my I problem would say with it. It's not there's... good as a classifier. Right. You know? I think you're right about that. And it's still being developed. The only yeah. thing or the last thing I'll say on it is just that I think there is something there in terms of we are infatuated with cre- creating a more sensory experiment when we're pacing and momentum. Absolutely. Are the thing that's precious. And that's why I would say Michael Bay's filmmaking and this movie do have similarities. I would it's argue all, about all movies have been about that mm. since the beginning because all movies have been pushing that direction since like and have been limited at the pace of technology uh, and right. maybe audience comprehension. Like not all of them are pushing as aggressively as this movie, but like that trajectory as right as you are, Abe doesn't seem unique to this uh, classifier to this either, era. but I'm just, I'm really just doing word dissection, which I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I find irritating when I, mean, I that's read all it this is. elsewhere. So like, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. No, I a hundred percent dude. Yeah, like it, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. This is all irritating. <laughs> this has been go. so I irritating. Should, <laughs> should cut this all out, <laughs> no, but no, you know, don't. people write. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, but people write papers on it, and that makes you smart if you write papers instead of doing podcasts. And so I'm gonna quote you and say to make myself seem smart. How I mean, I love doing that. Uh, I've been mm-hmm. quoting the four or five cool thinkers in the last forty years in every <laughs> occasion I can. Uh, yeah. So I'll just mention their names again. Derrida. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love talking to you, man. Yeah, same, uh, It's always a blast. Yeah. Uh, we definitely see eye to eye on a lot of stuff in definitely. movies, but uh, we try to, we vigorously attempt to find the differences because it's important to both of us that we're unique. That's uh, true. That's what, that, that's what makes the contention delicious. Um, <laughs> we do have thank delicious you for, contention. Thank you for uh, guest hosting today. Yeah, my this pleasure. This was a fun a conversation, man. Um, and to all the other people who have just been listening this whole time, uh, you know, maybe go have a good time. It's up to you if you liked what we were talking about. And then also uh, go to patreon.com slash small beans. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe fork over a few of those precious dollars so that we can keep the lights on. Um, <clears throat> we all, you'll get advantages and benefits like a lot of our podcasts. Now uh, we have a lot of exclusive podcasts, including uh, one that you and I and Mike are on, which mm-hmm. is called escape from the multi curse, where we discuss the trend of multi multiverses in the most, you know, the last two decades as well. Uh, so kind of part and parcel of this conversation. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Star Trek, the next Futurama and Spiel boys, which are collaborations with gameplay and employed. Um, and yeah, we also are making a movie currently. So uh, we we have uh, movie diaries that you can look into and kind of follow where we are because we're openly, transparently making a movie in front of our audience. And that's kind of what we got going down on Small Beans. So Is there anything things. you want to plug, my man? I mean, hopefully if you're here, you've heard of the podcast One Upsmanship that Michael Swam and I do on the iHeart Network. Uh, it's about video games. We do lapse into these esoteric conversations of transcendent meaning or the lack thereof all the time. So if you like that, there's so much more of it, but video games elsewhere to be found. Uh, I don't know, man. Uh, come see our Twitter. I have a Twitter. I use <laughs> yeah, it. I use it, it sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I, I stream yeah. video games on Twitch at the real yeah, games. Do. I do that pretty regularly. 
The real uh, games. I do it every time I play video games with some occasional exceptions uh, that are very rare. So you can see me play a game if that's a thing you'd like to watch. It's very enjoyable. I try and to make it a great enjoyable. community there. Yeah, there really people is. People who that's true. like to uh, like to poke fun at Adam. They and do. And then Adam pokes fun at him back because I he do. is daddy and you are children. My God, isn't um, it? Isn't it like that? It really is. That is like it. It really you is. Are, you are daddy, Adam. You're <laughs> God. dad. Adam. I'm so tired of it. I'm so tired, I'm so tired of bits, I don't man. like it. <laughs> I, I don't want to do any more bits. Just let me be a <laughs> fucking person. <laughs> Let me be. We'll a live person. in the present, my brother. I'm gonna try. Uh, and thank you, uh, thank you uh, for being here again. You bet, buddy. Love you. That's it for this one. Goodbye. Bye. This has been a small beans endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash small beans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash small beans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the small beans grow into huge giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you!